tutorial to set matters right in the most direct way possible. <laughs> yes, I think that's it. When all else fails, go for the easy way out. The obvious answer. The brute force solution. And we're like straight up in a mansion now. Hello. Hello. Hey. Welcome to the stream. And it's Rouse. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it's like house, mouse. There you go. Perfect. I was, I was trying to make you fancy, I guess. How are you doing, sir, tonight? All right, I've now successfully muted the Twitch stream, so this won't be really confusing. <laughs> I'm doing all right, doing all right. Good. I see you've made it to the asylum. Uh, yes, uh, it's been a very long time since I, so I wasn't quite sure where I was, um, but I'm starting to get recollection. I haven't played this up to this point since uh, maybe I was about 12, 13? Definitely going back. All right. So, yeah, that's... Uh... I haven't played this since we were 12 or 13 either. <laughs> <laughs> so just uh, for the chat, everyone watching, we have Richard, uh, one of the creative directors on the game. Is that correct? Yes, yes. I was the... Uh, in this one, I was the project lead, lead designer, and writer. Awesome, yeah. I, 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 there's usually that thing where people go, you know, don't attribute... Don't say someone is the creator of the game, because, you know, other people feel offended True. by that. There were a bunch of other folks. Yeah. Did. Yeah, yeah, it's tricky in big media like movies or games to yeah. attribute it all to one person, though. At least it's not like in movies where they attribute it to the it's actor. It's hard to attribute it, it to the whole team, so you understand why it happens, right? You'll have to forgive them, it's so yes, so um, if anyone has any questions in either the Facebook chat or the Twitch chat, drop them in there. We'll just have a nice casual conversation about the game. Um, I have one. Just a very simple starter. How did this game come to be? Did uh, did you pitch to WB? Oh, sorry, Midway, or did uh, you know, they just pitch it to you as a concept, make a horror game? How did this come to be? Yeah, at the time we Surreal Software uh, who made the game and where I worked had just shipped the second Draken game. Draken was a PS2 PS2 uh, fly around on a dragon game and. We were looking for new things to do, and there were a number of pitches I remember. And I think Midway said, we'd love to have a horror game. Um, so one of the pitches became a horror property. And this was uh, the, a rare case of us writing the pitch and then making that game uh, without massive alteration to what it was. I remember the original pitch. The It's often interesting when you're pitching a game, you're pitching to one set of people, and then you... Uh, make the game with a different set of people, right? So, uh, in this case, the original team wanted something more like Devil May Cry, which would have been a different type oh, wow. of control. And then the development team was into the idea of making it more like Half-Life. So, uh, it's sort of midway between those things. Midway hot. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it ended up becoming more the you know, type of direct control you had. Uh, which was cool with us. Awesome. Uh, did you guys? I see. That it's, I feel like there's a lot of influences of particular, like the the doctor. He reminds me of the doctor you see in House on Haunted Hill. Those references um, intentional? Were you like going after movies of that time? Yeah. I mean, that happened to be one that we'd seen. He um, has a look that's kind of like the House yeah. on Haunted Hill, but he isn't much like that guy. Other than that. Um, and I think we had watched that movie. And my references were really going back older horror stuff. Uh, and I remember making a list, like when we were starting, thinking, well, what are my favorite horror movies? Uh, and on that list was The Shining, Psycho, uh, The Birds, and Rosemary's Baby, and Ring, the first Japanese Ring movie, uh, which I had seen. I saw right around the time we were starting working on it. This was before the American remix. Yeah, it was uh, before you got here. I was reading off all the trivia I could find. And I uh -huh. saw that there was a, uh, a ring reference in all the phones. Yes, there. Are f I think there's a reference to each one of them or in the game, pretty well hidden. So you don't just. And it's always yeah, it's a phone somewhere, and if you pick it up, you get a line from that movie spoken in some weird voice, and it might be altered a bit, so it's not a complete off but uh yeah those are the ones um 
but also like you know i was into like edgar Allan poe and um some stephen king but also like jack ketchum who's a really dark author who i liked um so some of that was influences as well so it wasn't just cinematic stuff yeah someone in the comments um roth had asked if any novels in particular but you kind of just went over that the timing um yeah. Ron Chitlin just asked, uh, were there any plans for a third game in this series, possibly with a new location and protagonist since Torque's story concluded in the second game? Yeah, um, we actually did have conversations about doing a third game um, before we ended up not doing it because the studio ended up working on a, on a game called This Is Vegas for a while, <laughs> which was a huge change. Um, but by the time Surreal was working on that, I had actually moved on. I was still working at Midway, but wasn't working at Surreal. Um, and yeah, the third game basically had a really early sort of pitch, and that was it. Um, and it was still going to be a torque thing, but it was going to be more about his past, farther back in his past than like his his ancestral past, like his his uh, um, parents and stuff. Um, and I was thinking of setting it in a more of a plantation style prison like Angola, Angola or something like that. Oh, wow. Because um, all the games have a prison. Oh, wow. In them. Somebody not from Louisiana who knows about Angola. Oh, well, I've researched a lot about prisons. <laughs> yeah, that's An interesting cool. thing about Angola is it's, it's a former slave plantation. And they basically took it and turned it into a prison. Um, and then still get people to work for no money there. So... I'm What's hearing that? some bonging. Did I drop out there, or was that something What's else? That, uh, no, that was me dropping out. Oh, okay. Cool. What's that George Lucas quote? It's uh, it's like poetry. It rhymes. <laughs> yeah. Right. That sounds like a really, a really good concept. I like that. We were mentioning yeah, it earlier. Yeah, it didn't get super far, and it was supposed to be more about racism than the other games had been. And yeah. I remember the executives being like, "Well, well I don't know about that." <laughs> Yeah, but I was mentioning earlier that this game where, where... did something where you get a, a, a biracial protagonist, and that's like a really interesting story, especially for the time. You didn't get a lot of that. I mean, you're still struggling getting a lot of representation in games today, and this was a really good early example. Yeah, no, that was, um, you know, early on, and we didn't, it's funny, we didn't really see him as, you know, let's make a statement or right. like let's let's diversify or something, and there was a lot less conversation about that when this game was made but it was a couple of things one was the idea of hey maybe he's like Vin, you know um even though he's not much like vin diesel in the end. uh <laughs> but just that sort of you don't really know you mm -hmm. know he doesn't really say and you don't really know like kind of kind of like his riddick character yeah that or just him in general he doesn't Vin doesn't say I'm African American or I'm not or I'm Italian American or like in in Saving Private Ryan he plays a, a Italian guy right um, and he's just kind of dark skinned Italian. Vin guy. Diesel was in Saving Private Ryan. Yeah, <laughs> oh my yeah he's God, one of the original like crews. I believe never he, realized he dies in the sniper sequence in the first third of the movie. Oh my God! Wow. <laughs> yeah, and he has lines and stuff, but yeah, that was sort of right as he was becoming famous. You know, before pre Fast and the Furious. Um, anyway, so there was that idea hey, this guy works. And I liked that because I'm a fan of players, you know, making, being able to pick characters and have them become those characters and feel like, hey, this person is someone I could be. Um, and having someone who was of undetermined ethnicity was just another step towards that. So, um, and then also, I, you know, Knowing, oh, this is one of my favorite pieces of graffiti you just saw there. Yeah, I like that. Um, the next room is really great, too. The Jesus, the rats. The Good rats. <laughs> oh, one of these rooms has a, oh, yep, yeah, the, the guy from the one video. <laughs> the rats you have know, masks. The Metallica video about the, about the guy with, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. <laughs> <sighs> Bringing back memories. Eating that poor guy. Now, you can make a moral choice to shoot that guy or not. Oh, the stream voted I, I play as an asshole, so I think I'm just going to let him suffer. <laughs> well, that was that was the question, was is that the dick move, or is, is the dick move to, to um, kill him? 
And I can't remember if he actually plugs into the morality system or not. Let's so find that's out. Horrible. That's even more horrible than I remember. <laughs> Poor guy is just choking up. There's <laughs> yeah, nothing left. Let's shut the door on that. That's right. <laughs> I got good points um, for that. Okay. <laughs> you know, I was curious. Uh, again, I was, I was trying to find anything for us to, to talk about, trying to look up trivia and stuff. I wasn't aware that this game uh, had its rights to be a movie optioned. Um, do you know anything right. about that? Yeah, it happened. Um, and if you know anything about Hollywood, they option a lot of things. And yeah. Um, but at the time, Midway was owned largely by Sumner Redstone, who also owned Paramount, which owned MTV. Um, and so he had made, you know, there was a lot of like conversations between MTV and Midway about various things. And that was one of them. And they did end up optioning it and you know worked on it basically on their own for a while and sort of in in script development um mode but never really getting beyond that as far as i know i know online you can find a to intel edgy for if i'm pronouncing his name correctly uh was cast as torque at winch point which which i would be fine with but i don't think that's actually true at all. Oh, <laughs> i think that's just a somebody wrote it in a forum somewhere and then it got yeah. picked up by some Wikipedia entry. Uh, I don't think they ever got that far. And years later, I actually met an author who had told me he had pitched for writing the screenplay and he had a whole treatment about like a native American burial ground or something. And I was like, Oh, I'm glad you didn't get that gig. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it's always the thing is following any kind of stuff like that. I remember um, the dudes that made, the Final Destination movies optioned the rights to make a Metroid movie in like 2004. Oh, right. That never happened. <laughs> well, wasn't uh, Gore Verbinski was going to make a Bioshock movie at one point? Yeah. I would yeah, have loved to just through. look at that. Just look at that film. <laughs> His visual style Who is knows? great. Well, there's a new, there's a new film out uh, from Guillermo del Toro this fall. Uh, Water or the something shape of like water, that. Yeah. Yeah. Shape of water, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Looks really it good. Looks like, and Guillermo was, I think he was involved in a Bioshock project at one point, um, a film project. But he's a big Bioshock fan, and you look at that movie and say, oh, so this is like Bioshock, but with this sort of weird, you know, crossed with Hellboy character, yeah. uh, you know, Abe Sapien from Hellboy, uh, crossed with a, you know, sort of touching emotional tale. Anyway, that movie looks fantastic. It yeah. really does. Oh yeah. We have another question from Roth. Uh, what was your favorite thing slash idea about the game that didn't make it into the final release? I'm assuming the first game. Right. Um, it's funny, as I as I mentioned, you know, what we pitched was what we made more than in any other project I've ever seen. So there wasn't a ton that was cut outright. Um, interestingly, originally, there were supposed to be no cutscenes in the game, if you remember that Half-Life Right. That Half Life was an inspiration, and um, you know they had no cutscenes. I mean, they have scripted scenes, but they don't have ones where you look at the camera. So we were working on that direction for maybe four or five months. And at some point, Midway Listen, insisted we had cutscenes. And looking at it, wedding, looking huh? back on it now, it's super hard to imagine that old. not happening. Oh, that poor guy! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta play it up. Yeah, right. Oh, hey, Sergey. I like them. Uh, then I, I didn't really realize that the uh, devil on your shoulder just says filthy immigrant. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> He's kind of a mean guy. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty devilish. Oh, hey. The few, I remember when we originally, you know, it was actually an opposite case of not a lot of stuff getting cut, but a lot of stuff getting added. And originally in the game, there were no flashbacks. Hmm meaning that those and and i don't i guess i i just i should define that better that video you just watched a minute ago um was one of 10 actual full motion video flashbacks that we had i think it was 10 um, and those were planned from the beginning and they were kind of expensive to make but then as we were developing it we thought oh it doesn't have enough spooky stuff and if you only have 10 of those scenes in a you know 10 hour game or whatever that's not enough so we then ended up coming up with those slow-mo sequences where you'll see something horrible happen, um, mm. you know, usually involving your wife or kids or some historical event. And those were added late in development. Um, 
the last six months or something, we decided we should do these. And so we put them in. Um, and it's sort of hard to imagine the game without those, too. Uh, and I remember, yeah, there wasn't a model for for Carmen and, and the kids for until the last three months or something like that. Oh. Now, you'd mentioned that, um, like, Devil May Cry and Half-Life were, were things that were, I guess, sort of like a starting point for the design of this. Mm -hmm. Um were there other games that were influences? Because earlier we have been talking about just games of this this era. And I find it kind of interesting that, like, no matter who made this kind of third-person action shooter game, that pills seem to be this, like, ubiquitous health item. It's like, <laughs> right. were, were, were there any, any, like, games that directly influenced, or just was it just, like, osmosis? Well, in terms of the pills mechanic specifically, it was pain uh, fair which, enough which had pill bottles and a health i think our health model is copied directly from max pain where your health goes down to low but then recharges up to like 20 percent or something um and then you can get pills to get it back all the way up um i think in this i can't remember we changed the health mechanic in the second game where the pill bottles work differently and i think they i think you didn't use them anymore i think you just auto used them when you picked them up but yeah, so Max Payne was an inspiration for that. And that was really one of the few at that time third person games that had shooting that felt like a first person shooter and didn't feel like because Resident, you know, uh, like Resident Evil or Devil May Cry have, you know, tank controls or whatever you want to different things where you're not looking direct. You're not looking the same way your character's looking. Um, and then as a result, that means, you know, the game has to play very differently. So we were very much making a game that was, you know, you're looking where the character's looking. Though originally in the design, there was a much more hardcore target lock feature where you would lock onto guys and then strafe around them and shoot them. Um, and you, aiming was really not important. And then during development, um, Max Payne came out for console and Halo came out for console, the original Halo. And we said, hey, look, this works on console. We can get this to, we can make actual aiming shooting work. So that was a pretty big shift. That was about six months in. We changed from a target lock input to, or a target lock control scheme to a real aiming one. Well, that's, that's cool, because it's always something that's fun to look back on is, is how gaming trends can change. I mean, right. like, dual stick shooting is just, it's how, so video, game, now. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. how video games work now. But uh, um, famously, I think now, there's a review of the tie-in game for Alien Resurrection on PlayStation 1. And it got a uh -huh. horrible review for having dual stick aiming. And they're like, this right. is really confusing and hard. It's like, well, well, time's changed. There were a lot of games that did it badly before. And Halo really sort of cracked the code of it with their subtle aim assist stuff that they do yeah. where it feels like you're aiming, but actually it's helping you more than you realize. And we copied that stuff pretty much down to the, down to every last feature um, to get our aiming to feel as good as it does. And I still don't think it feels quite as good as Halo's, but, um, but we got That's pretty close. That's the thing that a bunch of developers were talking about on Twitter a couple of weeks ago though, where people think they want a super realistic game, but if you don't help them a little, you get really upset. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, unless, you know, it's it all depends the type of game you're into, but yeah, by and large, uh, games like games that reach a, a mass audience have a little more help going on than people realize. Uh, we have a really question that. here. Uh, Ron Chillen asks I remember reading somewhere years ago that this game was a direct response to the weaker protagonists of Silent Hill. Was that real or am I, or am I misremembering? No, that was a real thing. Um, you know, we liked Silent Hill and it played the second one in particular, uh, which I believe came out right before we started development. Um, and that was obviously a great game. But it felt like in that game, you know, you'd have a stick and like three guys shambling towards you and it would just be crazy difficult to kill them mostly because you were fighting with the controls the whole time and we came as you know as, as sort of a surreal had its roots as being a, a pc developer we were used to games where you had more control over what was going on and you were not as as you know the, the tension wasn't fighting with the controls as it was in something like resident evil so we said hey could we make a game that's a horror game 
where you don't have terrible controls. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, as a result, you know, the body counts a lot higher and things like that, but uh, uh, you're just getting your challenge in different ways. So yes, it was a response. We also sometimes refer to it as, you know, an American horror game. Uh, Cause so many of the most popular games came from Japan at the time. Yeah, it does feel distinctly American horror. Like about it. Yeah, well, even like the creature designs were commenting that the, the creatures feel very Clive Barker. Yep, yep, definitely an influence as well. But that really came down to the concept artist who made most of them, Ben Olsen, um, was really, just had a very, you know, he would just draw stuff. And I'm sure, you know, you could talk to him and get his influences, but it was really, you know, a combination of weird bondage stuff and just, you know, different twisted ways to pervert human figures. Um, and I never felt, I mean, it feels Clive Barker-ish, but I don't think it's just a rip off of that either. Were there any like really cool enemies that just didn't make it into the game? Um, I feel like there must have been. Was there ever a concept uh, art book or anything like that release? So there was an art book for the second game. Well, there was a book Midway put out called. I've got a copy of it here. I'm gonna I'm gonna pull it off my shelf. Oh, nice. <laughs> we need more horror art books in general. Finally found where to go too, so that's nice. <laughs> Yeah, I can't tell if you're uh, deliberately playing badly. No, I'm bad. It's, a... oh. <laughs> it's late and I'm distracted. <laughs> you're so, not bad at, at staying alive. You're staying alive. But, yeah, I'm uh, running in circles. I would, I would probably be dead several times because I get cocky and then get, get caught. But, uh. There's pills. The puzzles are super cool in this game, so. Fair enough. But yeah, Midway put out a book called The Art of Midway. Mm. It really is a promotional thing, but it's got an ISBN number and a price on the back of twenty four ninety five. So I think they did sell it somewhere. Um, but it has a bunch of concepts, but mostly from the second game. And those are some by Ben and some by this other guy, Jason Mark. Maybe that'd be nice to check out. Yeah, I imagine it's pretty are defined these days. Oh, right, and it had this other game we were working on that I've forgotten until this very second. Uh, it was another horror game? Or something? Uh, it was genre? called... Um, let's see what it says in this book about it. It was called... It's called very. It never had a good name. That's a problem. If you're developing a game and you can't come up with a name, it's a bad sign. <laughs> Uh, even even early on, because you just want something for the team to latch on to. Remember, it makes your thing real. Um, right, here it is. Mike Nichols, art director at Trail Software, says, After completing The Suffering, we explored many ideas about types of environments and games we'd like to explore. One such game we referred to as The Hunted took place in a desolate American rural backdrop where players would have to survive being hunted. The idea behind these concepts was to see if we could create a well-lit environment and blah, blah, something about art. Um, anyway, it was sort of, uh, it was very much like Resident Evil before Resident Evil. Um, so it was like sort of a American backwoods and, uh, but we didn't have a super, there was nothing supernatural in it. So you're being hunted by humans. And then that always leads to this weird you know, why are there so many of these people hunting you? This doesn't make any sense. Uh, which is one of the great things about suffering is it just forgives it, all these questions by saying, well, there's supernatural stuff happening. Oh, see, that was one of my things that I always loved about, like, um, Condemned. Is the first Condemned. Oh, right. There's no explanation. It's just, I don't know, fuck you. The homeless people are crazy. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, that always, I mean, yeah, I feel like there's a breaking point with that for me, but certainly lots of games um, ignore that breaking point and happily go on and make lots of money. So, <laughs> do you think that's getting harder as time goes on? Like, as we get more and more ways to communicate, that it gets harder to explain away the backstory in developing a new game? I think there's a disconnect 
depending on your subject matter and how serious you're trying to, to be. So if you're making, you know, Call of Duty, say, to pick a random example, and you are, um, you know, just in this sort of over-the-top Michael Bay experience of war that doesn't really feel like anything like re reality. It's very cartoonish and over-the-top. It's sort of like, oh, yeah, well, there's a lot of people to shoot. Plus, it's a theater of war, which is always, you know, one explanation for why there's so many guys to shoot. Um, but it becomes more, pro like a lot of people have brought up this problem with Dead uh, Redemption, which is a game I like a lot and is a really good game. But it's, you know, when you compare, you know, how many people Billy the Kid murdered, who was the most murderous, you know, outlaw there was, and he killed six people uh, versus <laughs> James James Marston or whatever killed 300 people for the course of that game or a thousand. I don't know. A lot of people. Uh, it's just kind of, and that game treats it very seriously. And and again, I like it, but at some point, it's like, why are you murdering all these people again? You know, isn't there another way? Uh, so, I, I think that's why zombies are still so popular because that's another thing that sort of answers that question. Well, there's zombies. There's endless yeah, supplies. it's it's, it's right? the trifecta of what I always call the trifecta of video game enemies that are like totally cool to kill: aliens, Nazis, zombies, yeah, oh, aliens, right. Nazis, <laughs> and zombies. Um. And you can throw robots yeah. in there for good measure, although they don't pop up. Right. Yeah. There we go. Finally found where to go. Uh, just want a reminder to everyone watching the stream. We, this is for charity. We're donating money to Extra Life uh, Children's and Miracle Network Hospital. So please go to extralife.relyonhard.com and contribute whatever you can to help sick children. It's a great cause as we shoot monsters in the face. That it is. Great. Yeah, I'm looking at all the concepts in this book, and I don't see anybody who was cut. Though they're sort of alternate designs of some people. The, the Marbus troopers from the second game, who were the military group in there, used to look significantly more like superheroes. Yeah, I think once I finish this one, I'm probably going to pick the second one up. I've never played it. Uh, at the time, my Xbox decided to be very particular about what worked in it. Actually, had uh -huh. to put it on like a, a slant sometime just for it to read discs. Oh, yeah, so that, that was a game I never got to play, unfortunately. Right, right. Uh, something we were talking about earlier is that all the enemies are based on different types of uh, deaths in prison. We have lethal injections, we have death by gunfire, hang enemies. Is that basically the general, the general theme for all of the creatures in the game? That they represent something from, I guess. Yeah, they're all execution. Okay. execution methods of one type or another like even the infernas who you'll get to later uh, they're they're represent you know being burned at the stake which is tied to the witch trials plot in the game um and yeah that was just a that that wasn't there from the very start the idea that all the creatures would be themed that way but pretty early after ben had made some concepts I said, well, what if all these guys were connected some way and they weren't just, you know, whatever crazy thing we thought of. So he had made like the Slayers who were originally called cartwheelers, originally cartwheeled in the concepts he made. There's something that was cut. Um, he, uh, uh, he had done that guy. He had done, that was another early creature made the game. I'm trying to think through all of them. I think maybe the witch character had been made early as well, uh, the, the Inferno. And then I said, well, what if they were all tied to execution methods? And I remember there was originally, uh, well, we just want to make whatever we want to make. Why should we be confined? But it's pretty, it's a pretty good constraint to have, yeah. I think, and allows you to tie. You can do a lot of cool stuff with that. So then the noose man came after that. It's like, oh, death by hanging, right? That makes sense. And he was originally designed as a ripoff of the... Um, hanging tongue things from Half Life. If you remember those, the, yeah, the, yeah, 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 the original Half Life. I think it, they were in Half Life Two as well. But uh, they were sort of like, "There's a thing that grabs you," and obviously it evolved and changed to be somewhat different. But, um, so yeah, we ended up making them all that way, and that sort of became, you know, one of the. It's sort of then it was. It's one of those ideas you have together with everything so well that like I can't believe we weren't doing this already. Um, because yeah, it fits with Torque being a death row inmate, it fits yeah. with it being in prison, and um, if the theme of the game is sort of atrocities through the ages, that like going with various death penalty measures, 
uh, seemed like a good way to go. Um, let's see here. We got another question from Ron Chitilin, how you pronounce that. Was it intentional that the three ghosts of the first game lined up with the three morality paths? The go was, the was the ghost concepts changed with the two new ghosts in the sequel? Right. Um, yeah, no, it wasn't my intention, though I could see you interpreting it that way, and I don't want to undermine that interpretation. Um, you kind of had... I don't know. It's not like one of them is good. Right. <laughs> exactly. They're all bad. Like, you have Hermes, who's sort of the worst, uh, who is the, the um, executioner, the lethal injection, the or the, rather, the gas chamber guy. Great um, um, for him, too. Yeah, no, he was really good in the um, actor we had doing that. We <laughs> brought him back for some other characters for the second game, but he originally refused to come. Uh, well, he, the guy who played that, also he also played Horus, the electric chair enemy, who just screams all his lines. And voice actors hate that, <laughs> so he was like, "I'm not doing that game again." Wait, and I said, "No, no, you're playing a different character." Okay. <laughs> no more screaming for Horus, because he's he was a professionally trained opera singer like head gigs and stuff and it's like that my voice did not recover for like uh so that was i i i, I would be more i i i'd like to think i'm older and wiser and respectful of not destroying actors voices <laughs> this like is what that. they're on strike for now yeah <laughs> well that's over the strike's over oh right yeah finished the but last yeah that weekend. was one of the things they complained about right. Let's see here any more questions in the chat now, Destiny, Burke, you have any questions? I don't want to take that too much. Um, no, I just, I, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm always fascinated, like I was saying with this era of video games, I feel like there's a lot of design decisions, both from like a gameplay standpoint, but also from a visual standpoint, that like, I guess on the one hand you can say that like, oh, gaming has advanced past this, but I also feel like a lot has been lost, like we were talking about the flashlight, I miss the shit out of flashlights that work like this, that can actually see stuff. Because now flashlights are like hyper realistic, you can't see anything. <laughs> <laughs> and it's oh. pretty rare to have a flashlight totally run out. Yeah. I don't know, it depends on the game. It depends on the game, but I, I wouldn't say it's still. I had forgotten that Killjoy runs around this room. That's so great. <laughs> Just yeah, looking at his animation, it's like, I love this. Hey, where did the idea come from for having a Torque actually become one of these beasts? That was early on, too, um, and another one of those. It's so obvious why I'm not doing it. But it re that was a really a gameplay thing. I had the shooting, you know, he could throw Molotovs and grenades later and stuff. Um, but it felt like there wasn't quite enough player verbs. You know, there wasn't enough things for the player to do and worry about. And so early on, I had the idea of, hey, let's, what if he turned into a creature or something? And you never knew why that was. Uh, I think the narrative sort of followed, but the original impetus was really, you know, we need more stuff for the player to be able to do. Um, and then it fit really nicely. Though the, the creature, you know, often, I don't know if we want to talk about Stan Winston's involvement with this game. Um, if you remember, Stan Winston, famous creature effects artist, was was titularly attached to this, but actually didn't do much work on it. Um, it was a fairly common thing, in, particularly then, of like, let's get the celebrity attached. They don't have to actually do any work, just use their name. Um, so, he, it, it took so long to sign that deal that when Jerusha, who's the lead artist, and I went down to uh, leaders on the project. She and I went down to Los Angeles to meet with them, but it had taken so long to get the contract signed that we already had all the creatures drawn at that point. So it was like, well, I guess you uh, draw some more creatures, but really we have these. And he looked at the concepts like, these are great. I love these. Yeah, let's keep doing this. <laughs> um, he had some other artists who like did some color treatment and stuff for us, but uh, all the designs came from a bit surreal. Um, but the one thing he didn't like was oh look, he's always gone. Um, he'll be back. Um, the one thing he didn't like was the original design for the raid. You know, I we call him different things. And the insanity creature, I think, was the official name. The official name. Um, he usually, originally, like sort of white mashed potato looking guy. 
with a big, more like a tusk for a thing to impale people on instead of that blade. And he did not like that guy at all. He's like, this, I, I, I can't have my name on this. This guy has to be redone. Oh, wow. Um, and it could, I couldn't tell if it was one of those things where when someone like that comes in, they always find one thing that has to be changed to just sort of make sure you know who's in charge. Um, but it was actually a fair point. And when he brought it up, Drusha and I were like, you know, that's a good point. And we went back and, and redid him with the form you see now in the game. So, so that was that was an important that was an important change. Yeah, I, I really like the design. It's fun. Just the mechanic itself yeah. was a uh, nice power fantasy when I was a kid, just freaking out and just breaking things apart. It's always right. Nice. <laughs> there were a lot of arguments with the art group about whether he's wearing the tank top or not when he's in creature mode. Oh, I never noticed that. Uh, and he's not. He's not wearing it. He does have sort of, kind of has pants on, prefer. Yeah, they kind of turn to so skin. He's not naked. <laughs> yeah, but they kind of turn into skin, exactly. And I kept, I would, my thing was saying he's not the Hulk. Not the Hulk. <laughs> he's a man, he's a crazy manifestation. He's not literally Torque, you know, made bigger, but still wearing the same clothes for no. We didn't make like, a comment earlier about how the other inmates, when you go into this mode, they don't really notice. They just see you as angry. They're like, right. oh, man, Twerk, you really have a temper. Right. So, yes, I was wondering, um, does that carry with all the other creatures? Are they actually seeing these things, or it's just Twerk's own transformation? Yeah, not I seeing? think you'd find that they react to the other creatures who are in there. Um, they're, you know, they talk about, that thing had blades for hands, man. And they say stuff like that uh, at different times. But, yeah, they they react differently to Twerk. I don't want to give it away. <laughs> Spoilers. But... Yeah, it's sort of there to let you wonder what's really real. And then we end up playing with that. Oh, do you, want, do you want us to with us, Tor? Let's see, we got a question oh, from I Roth. Love this hedge maze, too. This is there. If there was a new spiritual successor to the suffering, what would be added? I think we had added? talked about that years VR, ago. man. <laughs> <laughs> VR the suffering, you just run around slashing. That's it. They should just make this VR right now. The suffering. <laughs> Total vomit. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, more fur. That would be sort of a, the furry version. Okay, um, uh, sorry. Well, you are in the hedge, you know, you're just in the hedge maze where, which is all about the shining, which has that nice furry scene at the end. Um, yes. These uh, burrowing dudes, let's see. The burrowers. The bur that's what they're called. Um, have you been to the, at this point, you've been to the quarry, right? Already? I believe so, yeah. I jumped out of it uh, before I right. got to the... And there were crane puzzles and stuff yeah. like that. I gotta cool. through the maze here. Uh, so are the burrower supposed to be, like, buried alive, or...? Exactly. Which isn't a... Um, a common execution method, but it pops up every so often. And here it was tied to the fact that the guys working in the... There was a scene, I don't know if you saw it, it sort of possible to skip it um of guys being buried alive while they were working on unsafe conditions at the quarry yeah and the guards just not caring enough to prison management not caring enough to um to make things safe enough that people wouldn't die have you do you ever use the the uh the tnt sticks or the other explosives on these burrowers uh occasionally i just keep forgetting the key i'm so used to playing with them. right yeah they're uh there's special code, I remember, where if you throw the explosive near the little hole, it actually goes, it sucks it into the hole and then kills the guy. I remember that now. I just yeah. did it. <laughs> it's been so long. Wow. Uh, and I think they do, they do a custom death animation then, too. Yep. Yeah, uh, get out of here. I, good let's, let's check we were, we were reveling. Time. We were reveling in the head explosions earlier. Oh, the little gibbs. Yeah, that was a. I mean, we. I think we were always doing that, but that was something Midway, because Midway's the you know the combat company, so they're into violence and and we were fine with doing the violence, though it wasn't our you know our our number one artistic goal to make something with a decapitation system in it, but it was like we were happy doing it, and uh, I don't know, it's just another thing that feels like you're doing something to the world, which I always like, like you're not just killing the guy with the same death animation every time you're actually i took his arm off that time that's great oh yeah, i i love games like one of my favorite games for that sort of thing is um 
the original fear. Uh, mm-hmm. is there's, there's so many, like, different ways for the, the those clone soldiers to come apart. One of my favorites is that, um, if you get close enough with a shotgun, there's a chance that they might just vaporize. And I remember the first time I played that game, like, I, I think it was like 15, I was like, WHOA! <laughs> <laughs> All right, it looks like we got another question. Somebody said, I did an LP of this a year or so ago, and I got some comments about the random flashes being most frequent at the insanity meter is Is that something that was intended, or are they actually real? <laughs> no, that's actually true. That's actually true. So, yeah, the crazier you um, the more flashes happen. And then, of course, when you turn into the creature, you use up that, then it goes back to stable. And that's actually, it's it's kind of a cool thing you know, a lot of modern games have moved away from having, you know, uh, bars for everything. Um, they'll sort of come back around and now we're doing bars for everything. But uh, for a while there, there was a move away from bars on the HUD. And uh, just seeing those flashes, I know, I remember when I would, I would realize those flashes are happening a lot. Time to use my Sandy power. Yeah, I, I, I quite like them. I like the, uh, when you, when you play as a is a good guy. I, I feel like I connect more with that. It's just it's nice getting all the notes and the dialogue from um yeah. family. Whereas when you're a bad guy, it's I, I I guess I was I got older I couldn't really get with being bad dudes anymore in games. Like, I used to just laugh and just enjoy it, but now I actually think about it, like, oh that's that's pretty terrible. That'd be really <laughs> right. hard to do if <laughs> that'd be really mean to break up my family like that and kill them. Yeah, it's interesting when I uh, as game designers because on the current game I'm working on, The Church in the Darkness, it's another game where you can sort of play more homicidally or less homicidally. And when I have fellow game designers play it, they're always trying to not kill anyone and play really carefully. And sometimes when I have non-developer friends play it, they're just like, well, I killed everyone. Seemed like that would get me through the game faster. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, but they were just people. Like, eh. <laughs> like, okay. <yeah. laughs> Different, you know. It's, it's up to you. Whatever you want to do. Let's see here. Wow, that river is running fast, isn't it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> that almost looks like a bug. <laughs> <laughs> it could be. I had to mess it could with be the uh, modern version. Yeah, right, that's the frame rate. Processor speed thing or something. Oh yeah, I was mentioning uh, when we first started the stream that a lot of um, games journalists at the time were freaking out about the blood system, how Torque actually got covered in blood. Like, it was this huge, oh, that's really awesome, that's truly next-gen feature. The PlayStation <laughs> right. 2 is showing off its true power. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was, and I remember seeing that, and that was a super effective feature, because people really noticed it happen. Uh, and there's a couple reasons for that. Like, we have a scene, like, the very early on scene, um, when Torque has just left the, the opening cell block, he goes down the hall, and during a cutscene, blood splashes on him, and his texture changes, so I think people get what's going on when we do that in the cutscene. Um, and then, uh, and it washes off in water, too, if I recall, like if you're in the sprinklers, like you're looking back in the prison, oh. if you go in there, the, the blood comes off. Um, but it was super simple to implement, and it's literally just... Uh, and this is an example of people not understanding how the game works a little bit. <laughs> it's just a texture swap, and there's like six of them, you know. So some artist went in and added blood by hand to six different versions of Torque, and uh, uh, then it just changes between those six versions depending on how much blood is splashed on you. <laughs> um, so it's nothing you couldn't have done in any game with textures, basically. <laughs> um, but there was a there was actually an interesting bit of tech where... Um, if you shoot blood, if you hit somebody and blood splat, like with a shotgun and blood splashes out their back, it will deform around chairs and stuff like that. That was pretty oh, unique. Cool. It'll actually create a custom mesh around the chair of a blood splatter on it. Um, so that was not, that is, you know, the PS2 showing off. It's, it's technology, technological power. <laughs> yeah, I think the only so- other game to really get, not- like, get notoriety for that was like Dead Rising. It took a long time for journalists to go, oh yeah, look at this, this game also does that. Right, right. That and, uh, uh, I don't remember if they were known for their blood, but you remember that there was a soldier raven? Uh, uh, and I think it was PC only. Um, but they made it around that time of like, they had already made Hexen and Heretic, 
and before they got into Raven. I'm forgetting what Raven made after that. But anyway, there was a Soldier of Fortune game, and it had a really detailed, like, you, could, you know, there'd be a dead body, and you could saw off limbs with your machine gun and stuff. Uh, and it was actually licensed from Soldier of Fortune magazine, if you guys know that magazine. Sort of a, a magazine for military fetishists and guns all over. Um... Uh, if anyone else in the chat, any few questions? Last questions as we uh, wrap up. I don't want to take too much of your time. It's up to you. Yeah, I got another 10, 15 minutes in me, probably. All right, so people on Twitch, people on Facebook, drop some questions in the chat as I make my way around here. and Get to... lost. Yeah, I'm getting yeah. lost real good. <laughs> yeah, I, I, when I, I tuned into the... Mentioned... Uh, um, Church in the Darkness having John and Ellen, John Patrick Lowry and yes. Ellen McLean in it. Um, Ellen being famous for being GLaDOS and John being famous for being the sniper in Team Fortress. But John's actually 13 characters in this game. Oh, wow. Well. Wow. Something like that. He plays his... The biggest one is he's the guard at the beginning. The first guard you meet who you hang out with for a little while. Um, sort of one of the shorter companion characters. Um... And then he is also, um, he's Hermes the gas guy. I was totally wrong. John. Oh. So there was another John, John Anderson, or John Armstrong. Sorry, I'm getting the name wrong. Um, he played Horace, the screamy uh, electric chair guy, and he played Killjoy. And then John Patrick Lowry's biggest part was Hermes the gas guy. But then he also played like every like guy you hear for three lines on a PA system once. And because John is just amazing with accents. Um, so that's another thing, uh, you know, connecting this game to what I'm working on now. So you've all known each other for a while. Right. So, yeah, we did this game and then he was in the second game. Um, uh, as a bunch of different characters there as well. And then I have sort of, we've stayed in touch and I had him on a panel I did at PAX before I started working on the Church in the Darkness game I'm working on now. And I went to some plays he was in and stuff like that. Um, and yeah, he's just a super friendly guy, great at conventions, loves meeting fans, as does Ellen. So. Yeah, we actually had them at our booth at PAX last, uh, you know, just a month ago. Or I guess it's almost two months now. But um, they signed for two hours at our booth. Oh, wow. Which is, which is and because we had announced it as they're going to be here from this time to this time. And they'd had a panel earlier in that day. So they said, hey, people come. And they came. <laughs> and, you know, and they're just, they talk to folks for however long they want to talk. And they just said, well, we'll stay here until the line's done. Um, but once they had packed up, someone came up and said, hey, could you sign this? She's like, no, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> she also tapped off. Because he's like, I will never leave if I don't say no at that point. So, so um, any new updates on Church in Darkness that you can share? Yeah, we're, um, you know, we've been, uh, uh, I've been working on it so long, it's a blur of <laughs> where we are right now. But uh, we're wrapping up. We're sort of trying to do our last voiceover sessions um, in the next couple months. Um, one next week with John, actually. And uh, we've got some other actors in the game we haven't announced yet who might be tied to the suffering as well. Oh. Um, so it's a bit of a bit of a reunion on that front. All right. Um, a little bit delayed here, but I forgot about this Jack puzzle. Um, <laughs> uh God, we worked on that a lot. Um, so yeah, we're we're sort of in the big push to being really content complete, and then trying to ship next year as early in next year as possible. Awesome. Um, I have finally yeah, made some progress yeah. here. <laughs> You're right. That truck is a. Speaking of some asking if Church in the Darkness is going to become POG. Yeah, we've been talking to them about it. Um, they were interested, and they came by the booth pack as well. So hopefully, um, I like to and I like to point out, hey, you guys just really suffering. I, you know, oh yeah. Uh, so I was glad they did that. It had been a long time of people saying, hey, where can I get this? And we saying, nowhere. <laughs> you know, look on eBay or something. Yeah, we. Had, I remember we had talked about it a couple years ago that we weren't sure exactly who had the rights, but Warner Brothers indeed had it. 
be interesting if they did yeah. something with it outside of reselling it. I'd like to see. I'd love yeah, to well, see like probably a HD yeah. version for uh, you know modern platforms. Yeah. Right. It is you know old enough that you'd probably have to really redo it versus yeah. just doing like a texture up res or something. Um, so that might be more expensive uh, than to do, but. Who knows? And I mean, I'm actually, you know, it's, I don't know how you guys feel about HD remakes, but I'm not a huge fan in general. I, I, I sort of feel like games come with a certain time period and we should just accept that that's what games look like then and it's okay. I typically don't mind just because it means they're more accessible now. Right. And they actually work. I yeah. Mean, I always compare it to like, it was a period where they were colorizing black and white movies. Um, and that was awful. They should never have done that. But you oh, could yeah. always still watch those, right? Because it's a movie. It plays and thing, right? Uh, whereas games are like Yeah, I mean, in general, I'd say that, like, I, th I think when you reach a point where you're actually, like, changing the way the game looks, then maybe you kind of stop. Right. But, um, but if you were going to make an HD version of this, you kind of have to rebuild it and... How would you not change how it looks, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'd like. I'd like. To, I would. I would be all behind a full blown remake. It'd just, <laughs> right. It'd be so good. I. I would rather have just a new. A new entry. So yeah. If fair I wasn't enough. Involved, I would rather say, hey, leave those alone and just make a new thing. Um, I see. They can. They can take the concept. And make some pressure. No, I'd be happy to make a new one. Uh, after I'm done with this game. Are you guys self-publishing? Yeah, so we're all indie up on this one. So um, we are self-publishing, and we're announced for PS4 and Xbox and, yeah, and Steam. So sweet. I'm definitely looking forward to that. Uh, we're getting up to the slave ship here. I believe I'm um, well, probably about what 60 percent, 75. Remember, no good deed yeah, goes I need to get unpunished. Some... Have you died at all in this playthrough? Uh, it's two or three times. Another, the other five times were crashes. <laughs> oh no! I'm glad it is. It has decided to cooperate while I've been here. Yeah, it's been pretty good. Yeah. yeah we, we've had a long standing. Yeah, save CJ. Yeah, we have a long standing <laughs> curse five minutes. of uh, save. of of doing these sorts of events and having our games totally crap out on us. Uh -huh. Um, last I I mentioned it earlier, but because it's funny. Uh, last year I played, I went out and bought a brand new sealed shrink copy of PlayStation 2, and the game bugged out. Uh huh. <laughs> Were you running it on a PlayStation 2? Yeah. Right. I'm like, you yeah. betrayed me. <laughs> well, it's probably, did you buy a brand new PlayStation 2? That's yeah, I know, that was the problem. Yeah, with because those, that was the thing that the DVD drives and those weren't up for the long haul, I found. Sort of depending when you got yours, but um, much yeah. more... I mean, the Xbox has failed for different reasons, but it felt like the PS2 DVD drive was just... just would get slower and slower, and seek times would get slower and slower, and that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah no, I'm, everything... watching, I'm watching CJ grind against the... Yeah, I'm trying to push the boat. Come on! <laughs> Pressing alt. <laughs> Not working. There's some stuff. Yeah, I mean, that was something I regret about the game. Um, not the raft. The raft's great. Uh, was uh, just you're not going to get on it, I assure you. Um, it really gets... The game was really too easy a bit, I think, particularly later on. You're just so up on... Like, I know our goal was to make the game, you know, where you weren't suffering with bad controls and that sort of thing. Um, but I feel like we just gave you too many resources towards the end. And it just became sort of a... And then we, like, up the monster count to compensate for that. Um, but it just became, I felt, a little bit of a slog in the layer parts of just, like, I got a lot of stuff, and I'm gonna shoot a lot of things, and I'm gonna... That's some for a while, versus like having being more limited on resources and having to make them. I mean, that always seems to be like a, a really tough balancing act for a lot of games. Yep, yep. And back then, you know, you couldn't patch, so you know, you yeah, a game and that was it. Whereas, probably in modern era, we would just um, you know, patch some sort to, to yeah. 
I don't know if it was that disastrous, but I would have wanted to do it. So. Don't know if they would have let me. Let's yeah. see. No other additional questions in the chat? Uh, you guys have any other last questions? Uh, no, just this game's real cool. And, uh, yeah, thanks. <laughs> Thank you yeah. for stopping by. I'm glad it I'm glad I've enjoyed this watching this middle part of the game, but I don't see that. Uh, I usually see the ending and I see beginning. For some reason I haven't rewatched the middle, so this has been well, Though I, I, I also I think I would have written in uh, in that respect. His accent's a little, the little foghorn leghorn. <laughs> he doesn't seem to like me anymore. <laughs> I think you shot him too many times. Yeah, Molotov's at the face. Oh, uh, so, yeah. I mean, that was another... That was a thing. Was I think any of the enemies, if you shot them enough, they became hot to you. Die. Yeah. He's never... You're never going to see the raft sail away. Oh. I believe the raft... It's Clem's raft, and you can get him to sail away on the raft if you do the right stuff. But... Oh, um, well, I'm playing as an asshole, so he's not leaving if I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> It's an interesting thing that, you know, another designer pointed out. It's like, you've made these really interesting things that are fun to hang out with that you can just kill at any time. <laughs> Which is uh, uh, not a common design decision. Modern days are not worry doesn't about seeing all the content. Supposed to die. Yeah. I don't, I'm surprised he's not dead yet. Yeah, he's, he's surviving. Good yeah. for him. Maybe you should, well, no. There's no way to get him on the raft now because he's friendly. He's still your buddy. I just have to figure. Where if I recall, I'm I'm having a flashback to the scripting logic of I think as soon as they go hostile, they just their brain like the part of the brain that does all the friendly stuff, and they just turn into a regular adversary. So the stuff that the logic that got on the raft has been deleted out of the left at this point. Now I must find the key to this door. That's right. Got to get into that slave ship farther if I remember. Well, I uh, don't want to hold you here too long. Um, again, thank you very much for hanging out with us, talking about the game and the uh, Church in the Darkness, which we are looking forward Good to. Good luck finishing. I'll check in. I'll, I'll look at the stream in, in four hours and see if you're... <laughs> hopefully, oh. I'll hopefully be done in two and a half, maybe, I hope. I don't know. Yeah, because we're not even done. Yeah. I think you're... I think you're... I, I always felt like the asylum was halfway, and uh, you're a little bit past that. So maybe three hours. Yeah, okay. Because work is going after this. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we're, we're jumping from this to Resident Evil 7, so... Uh, but at least I know I can finish that game real fast, so... Yeah. If this goes long enough, I can just push Resident Evil 7 right out of the... <laughs> and that'll, that'll yeah, be my vengeance. <laughs> <laughs> I remember they were always our, our nemesis of... A little bit. I felt that way anyway, irrationally, but... Because they, you know, when we we came out and then they released Resident Evil, which felt like the first one that was a shooter, right, at all. Um, yeah. I wouldn't really call it a shooter, but it felt like, hey, they stole all our stuff. And there was, I think, at one of the E3, a number of Japanese gentlemen buying the game for a while. Like, They're from Capcom or something like that. Um, and it's it's entirely possible we, we influenced them a bit, though obviously they're a much bigger franchise. Yeah, it must always suck to like, like you make I a game that's like, you, you know, it's fun and interesting and unique, and then Our like the main brand come. thing comes out and nobody, nobody notices come. yours. I feel, <laughs> I feel so bad for Horizon Zero Dawn because that game is fucking amazing, and came out the same year as Breath of the Wild, and that's it. <laughs> I don't know. I think people still remember Horizon. People oh, bring up Horizon to me as like, you gotta play this thing. Um, yeah, we'll see when awards time comes. Around. Right, though. Oh, yeah, a few weeks. Also yeah, we we will probably get a bunch of trailers and stuff too. And it'll be, uh, hard, it'll be hard to compete with Breath of the Wild and now Mario and. Oh yeah, yeah. We'll but hey, we can all look forward to the Shik Hydra butt. <laughs> oh yeah, forgot about him. A cool guy. All right, guys. Yeah, it's great to talk yeah, to you. Thank you so much for joining thank us. Thank you. I'm really looking yeah, forward I feel to like CJ's losing ground here, so I'm going to go. <laughs> <It's> embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs>
I'll figure it out. Good luck. Good luck to you. Thanks. Have a good night. All right. Bye. 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 Well, that was cool. Yeah. You just yeah. Make sure everything is. It's set always up. it's always fascinating to hear a dev talk about, you know, a project. Their own game. Yeah. Yeah. Just I don't know because because they're able to look at it from a vantage point that us as players simply aren't. And um, I don't know. I just always find that interesting, especially like how casually you're like. Like I don't, I, I wasn't paying attention to where you were, but there was something that you were 